very impromptu this, but um, let me just get rid of this very quickly, actually. There is uh, a lot going on at the moment in Parliament. Inflation numbers at 10%, um, and that's driven by food prices predominantly now in the latest inflation numbers. Liz Trust is currently um, answering questions, PMQs, and I thought we are tune in and listen to what is being said here. She's got some very tough questions to answer um, in a bid to try and understand whether we can claw our way out of this. Um, I'll provide a little bit of commentary, but I also need to catch a train in about half an hour. So let's uh, let's watch this and see how we get on and uh, see what is said by Liz um, in, her, in the House of Parliament. All right, let's go. No plan. Yes, Dharma. Mr. Speaker, last week the Prime Minister stood there and promised absolutely no spending reductions. They all cheered. This week the Chancellor announced a new wave of cuts. What's the point of a Prime Minister whose promises don't even last a week? Well, I can assure the right honourable gentleman that spending will go up next year and it will go up the year after. She can't but of say course, that. We she need cannot to get say value that. for taxpayers' money. The Labour Party has pledged hundreds of billions of spending pledges, none of which they've retracted. The honourable gentleman needs to reflect the economic reality in his policy. <laughs> Mr. She Speaker, can't those say that. spending cuts are on the table for one reason and one reason only because they crashed the economy. And working, working people. Working How can she people argue that that isn't the case? 500 quid more a month on their mortgages. And what's the Prime Minister's response to say she's sorry? What does she think people will think and say? That's all right. I don't mind financial ruin. At least she apologised. Yeah. Prime Minister. See, I, I think, think most people. Be some reflection well, of what economic she says. reality from the party. The fact is, the fact is, the interest. Let's not make any mistake. Her premiership and whether she, how long she remains in power depends on how good this performance is today. She's got a lot to answer for. With the inflation numbers coming out today. I'm, I'm, I'm really keen to see what the plan is going to be for those spending cuts come October 31st, because that is going to dictate what Andrew Bailey and the Bank of England essentially do when it comes to interest rate rises in November. Um, she needs to have a strong performance here. Didn't mean to pause these guys, but let's uh, just rates, continue to listen. Interest rates are rising across the world, and the economic conditions have worsened. And we are being honest. We're levelling with the public, unlike the honourable gentleman who simply won't do it. And what is the honourable gentleman doing about the fact that workers, train workers, are again going on strike? The fact is, he refuses to condemn the workers. We are bringing forward policies. Mr. Speaker, we are bringing forward policies that are going to make sure our railways are protected, people going to work are protected. He backs the strikers, we back the strivers. Mr Speaker, she's asking me questions because we're a government in waiting and they're an opposition, they're an opposition in waiting. Good point, good point. There's no, there's no getting away from this. Millions of people are facing horrendous mortgage repayments, exactly. and she's admitted it's her fault. Yep. She shouldn't have conducted an economic experiment on the British public. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not just her. They put her there. Yeah. Yeah. They're keeping her there. Yeah. Why on earth would anyone trust the Tories with the economy ever again? Yeah. Good well, point. Notice, Mr Speaker, he's not actually objecting to a single economic yeah. policy. Chancellor announced on Monday. He's refusing to condemn the strikers. We're on the side of working people. We're going to legislate to make sure we keep our railways. I think this is a pretty clever um, take, and I hope that Keir Starmer doesn't let her off on this because she's countering with, "We've made some changes, and you're not countering 
the or endorsing or saying anything about those things. She would have been briefed on this, really. And I hope Keir Starmer doesn't let her off the off off the hook with this. He needs to really drive home the damage and ask her direct questions on this. It's open. The honourable gentleman refuses to do anything. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, the only mandate she's ever had is from members opposite. Yeah. It was a mandate built on fantasy economics yeah. and it ended in disaster. Yeah. Yeah. The country's got nothing to show for it except the destruction of the economy yeah. and the implosion of the Tory party. Yeah. I've got the list here. 45p tax cut, gone. Yeah. Corporation tax cut, Gone. 20p tax cut. Gone. Two-year energy freeze. Gone. Tax-free shopping. Gone. It's like a club anthem. Credibility. Gone. (laughs) It's like a club anthem. Her supposed best friend, the former (laughs) chancellor, he's gone as well. They're all gone. So why is she still here? Mr. Speaker. Watch the pivot. Watch the pivot. I'm a fighter and not a quitter. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I have acted. I'm telling in you, you should get like a bowl of popcorn sure and a beer. This is beer to... Order. Order. I'm going to hear the Prime Minister. I suggest that all members need to hear the answer. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I am a fighter and not a quitter. We have delivered on the energy price guarantee. We have. We delivered on the energy price guarantee. This is semantics, right? The plan that she put out has been scrapped. We've got six months worth of work, uh, of help, sorry. What's going to happen come April is the numbers coming out right now, and I spoke about this on Step Pack Lunch yesterday. Energy prices are going to increase by 73% come April. 73%. Her two-year plan that was going to add £150 billion to the debt train is basically gone. It's scrapped. It's no more. She cannot say that she's delivered this energy plan when the one that was your flagship policy has just been ripped apart by the guy who's literally sat right behind you and you sat in the same position this past weekend or Monday, whenever it was, whilst he did it. And you said nothing. Like, people need a little bit of reassurance right now. This is infighting. This is theatre. As entertaining as it is, it is absolutely infuriating to see this happening in in Parliament. How is this going to instill confidence for people watching this who are scared to death that they can't afford their energy bills? They certainly won't be able to afford their food after the inflation numbers today at 10%, with food being the main component of that, and certainly won't be able to afford their rent when mortgages are going up and rents are going up because of the damage that she basically caused. It is absolutely crazy. We've delivered on national insurance. We are going to deliver to stop the militant trade unions disrupting our railways. The honourable gentleman has no idea. He has no plan and he has no alternative. James Grundy. Can I just say, obviously, it's more popular choice. Oh, James Grundy, you've got a future. (laughs) Would my right honourable friend congratulate Lee Centurion's rugby league team on their recent promotion to Super League, bringing millions to the local economy? And furthermore, would she also guarantee there are excellent women's Euros team, including Ella Toon from my uh, constituency, Tilsley, will receive the number 10 reception that they so deserve. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, I join, I join my honourable friend in congratulating the Lee Centurions on their return to the Super League. I had the huge privilege of meeting... But how much damage has she done in this month? In the month that she's been there, she basically tanked the, the, the pound, tanked the bond market, drove up mortgage rates for millions of households within a month 
do you understand how difficult that is to do? And that's because she was irresponsible with the policy decisions that she made with the mini budget. A month or not, that doesn't absolve her of the fact that her decisions were not the right decisions to make from an economic fiscal point of view. They were just wrong. And when you hear people like Biden, you know, smirking and laughing, saying that it was clearly a mistake, our reputation as a country has been damaged because we don't have com we don't have a competent person at the will. That's why it spooked the markets. That's why we've had to backtrack on all of these things just to get the markets to have confidence in in the fact that we'll be able to pay our debts as a country. It it's a month or not. The damage that she's done in that month is just it's mad. And if she stays, what what people who oppose her will argue is if she's done this in a month. Imagine what she's going to do in two years, bef up in between now and the, and the general election. It's it, people will argue that it that her position is unattainable now, and and for good reason. But this is not an excuse, in my opinion. It just isn't because the damage is, that she's done is is absolutely massive. Eating the lionesses last week, a fantastic team who won a major tournament for us. We will host the Downing Street reception as soon as their training programme makes them available. Yeah. I look forward to rugby league invite as well. Let's now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Black. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. After 10 U-turns in two weeks, we're left with a Prime Minister in office, but not in power, and families are paying through the teeth for her mistakes. Her latest this is what we need to get to the crux of. has put pensioners in the front line of Tory cuts. So can the Prime Minister perhaps turn to her Chancellor right now, get permission to make another U-turn, and commit to raising the state pension at the rate of inflation? Yeah. I honestly don't know what the honourable gentleman is talking about because we, we, we have been clear in our manifesto that we will maintain the. Okay, so let's let's talk very quickly about what he's mentioned there, the pension triple lock. So this is for state pensioners, and this is really, really important. So the state pension is basically paid for by people who are actively working. So everyone who's retired, who is receiving state pension right now, is essentially being paid that state pension through the taxes that we pay out of working people. Now, you may think that that's a little bit unfair. However, let's just work this out logically. Once upon a time, the people who are on state pension right now paid taxes for the people who were retiring when they were working. So this is like a conveyor belt. Now, the triple lock is essentially a guarantee that the state pension will rise every year in line with inflation, earnings, or 2.5%, whichever is highest. So inflation at the moment is at 10%. So by the triple lock rules, inflation should rise, the state pension should raise by the current rate of inflation being 10.1%. Now, why is that important? Imagine you've worked all your life, paid tax, paid national insurance contributions to get your full state pension for something like this to happen. And then the government renegs and says, we are no longer going to guarantee this triple lock so that you can actually live a comfortable life having paid into your pension, well, having paid Contribute uh, national insurance contributions to qualify for the full state pension when you get to retirement. That's what they're talking about right there. And at this point in time, there is a little bit of contention, a little bit of debate around whether or not she and the government are going to basically keep their promise that pensions will be operated by the triple lock. It may sound like it's very, um, it's a nonchalant thing, but trust me, it's not. Imagine if you had worked all your lives and you were in this position right now for energy prices to go up, for your rent pr uh, prices to go up, food prices, everything's gone up. And you don't have the guarantee that the state pension that you've contributed to all of your life and helped other people receive through all of your working career might not be sufficient for you to live on because of mistakes that this government has made. Imagine that. The triple lock and I am completely committed to it, so is the Chancellor. Well, Mr Speaker, 
it is no surprising that the Prime Minister's approval ratings are collapsing with an answer like that. The worst polling result for any Prime Minister in history. She has just thrown 12 million pensioners under the Tory bus. And it is not just pensioners feeling the pain. In the last week alone, I also want to hear Mr Blackford. Mr Speaker, it's not just pensioners feeling the pain. In the last week alone, inflation has risen to a 40-year high. Mortgage rates are at the highest level since the financial crash. And people's energy bills are about to rise to more than £5,000. Can the Prime Minister answer one simple question? Why does she expect everyone else to pay the price for her failure? Thank you, Grant. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. I don't much. think the honourable gentleman can take yes for an answer. Yeah. I've been clear. I've been clear. We are protecting the triple yeah. lock on pensions. And if, and if the if the honourable gentleman listen. Uh, she better be. <laughs> she better be protected the triple lock on pensions, on the state pension, because if she doesn't, it's just it. It just wouldn't be right. It would not be right. And twelve million people who are the people who would vote in the next general election, they will clear them out completely. And that's one of the reasons why they're probably scared to get rid of it altogether. And um, yeah, let's see. I mean, Sean's just asking here. Um, at what point do I see uh, civil unrest? Honestly, mate, I hope that we don't see it. But I think that if if this situation gets any worse and people having to make the real decision between heating their homes, eating, going to work because they can't afford fuel, paying their rent, paying their mortgages, there will be huge outcry, huge demonstrations. And... Um, Look, let's just hope we don't get there because it's not even worth thinking about in 2022. I mean, it's the UK, right? I mean, come on. In 2022, to be in this situation is pretty bad. Pretty bad. Is concerned about the economy. Why does he continue to advocate for separatism, exactly. which would plunge the Scottish economy into chaos? Very simple. Thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Um, over the last couple of years, thousands of homes have been proposed or built. I in sincerely hope not, mate. But which puts a huge strain on happened. GP and dentist uh, appointments. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, agree with me that more needs to be done in the planning process to make sure that when we have large-scale developments, we have more capacity in those vital services? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right. When we build new houses, we need to make sure there are GP surgeries schools, infrastructure, and that's why we're introducing a new infrastructure levy to make sure more of the money from developers goes on supporting local communities. Ed Davey. Mr Speaker, millions of family carers have been forced to cut back on food and heating. No worries, man. I've had good, good feedback on, uh, on doing this, and though I was apprehensive at the start, if you guys you like it, I'll continue. warm water several times a day, this will cause him to physically decline. So how do we pay for the gas to heat the water if we are currently at max Didn't budget? But all people and carers are struggling enough already in this cost of living crisis, Mr Speaker. So will the Prime Minister guarantee that support for the vulnerable, including carers' allowance, will rise by at least today's inflation rate of 10.1 per cent? Prime Minister. People are struggling. It is difficult at the moment. That's why we put in place the energy price guarantee to make sure the typical household isn't paying more than two. See, this is the thing that annoys me, right? He's asked her a very direct question. Just say yes or say, look, we can't guarantee anything. We're going through a budget at the moment to try and balance the books. However, we will endeavour as best as we can to ensure that we are looking after the people who are going to need help the most. Why is she starting? I mean, she might say this. I've just cut her off as she started speaking. But why start off with a pivot, with a position, with a framing uh, kind of setup? Just fucking talk like a human being. Like, just be normal. £2,500. It's why we've supplied an extra £1,200 of support to the most vulnerable. And I can assure the right honourable gentleman, we will always support the most vulnerable. They will be our priority. Hey, Jones. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
you, Mr. Speaker. Brecon and Radnorshire has a proud military footprint. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not least the Cambrian patrol exercise, which I visited oh, last yeah. week. Yeah. It is considered the Olymp Olympic gold medal in infantry training, attracting teams from across the world yeah. to compete in a 60 kilometre march over two days in the Brecon Beacons. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating all those who took part, not least the team of Gurkha soldiers yeah. from the Infantry Battle School yeah. in Brecon, who took home a coveted gold medal, further cementing Brecon's special place in the UK Armed Forces? Yeah. Well, yeah. I join my honourable friend in thanking everybody at Brecon Barracks who organises the exercise Cambrian Patrol each year. It is a world class training exercise, and I congratulate Brecon's Gurkha soldiers for their fantastic achievement of a gold medal. Well done. Yeah. Dr Philippa Whitford. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It took just five working days for the Prime Minister to crash the pound, damage pension funds and send people's mortgage costs spiralling. Her new Chancellor may have reversed almost all of her policies, but the damage has been done and we now face yet another round of Tory cuts and austerity. So I'd last like to ask the Prime Minister and those sitting behind her, why is she still at the dispatch box and when will voters get their say on this disastrous government? Yeah. Prime Minister. We are facing very, very difficult economic times. I took, I took the decision I had to. All right, let me just let me just answer this question really, really quickly because this is really, really important, and I think at the the crux of what people are thinking right now. So I've spoken a, a lot about this on on Packed Lunch and Channel Four and across a, a number of of programs. So look, there is help out there currently, and I think the word currently is really, really important um, because obviously there are benefits. That you can that you can sign up for. So if you are married, for example, simple things like your marriage allowance. So your marriage allowance is if you've got a household, husband and wife, for example, one of you is earning fifty thousand pounds for 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 example over your personal allowance of twelve thousand five hundred and seventy. If the partner isn't earning up to that personal allowance, you can actually gift £1,260 of your personal allowance to the partner who is earning more money. Now, what does that actually do? It means that you can save a little bit of tax by the tune of about £252 a year. That's if you're married. It doesn't work for everybody. However, in, in some households where maybe the, the wife or the husband is a stay-at-home partner and not earning up to the personal allowance of 12570 you can gift that 1260 to give the other partner who is earning over that amount a tax cut, putting more money in your pocket. There are tons of benefits that you can actually access, but this is the easiest thing that I think that you could do. So I'm working at the moment with uh, Turn To Us. They are a non-for-profit non charity, and they basically help people access benefits, grants, things that you may think that you're not actually eligible for at this point in time that you might be. And what I'm encouraging people to do, and they're not paying me for this, they're a charity, it's me working with them because I want to actually help people, is you can actually go onto their website and you can go and fill out their benefits calculator, their benefits assessment. They will then find out or not whether you are missing any benefits, like if there's any childcare costs that you might actually get covered. Do you qualify for universal credits? Any number of benefits. If you are a working family and you are struggling right now, it is really, really important that you go and check out their calculator and speak to them because they are helping thousands and thousands of people. I was speaking to one of their um, representatives who was on my podcast maybe about two months ago. She was saying that most people who come to them don't realize that they're eligible for any benefits. And when they go through the calculator, the average that they're able to find for people is in the tune of about £5,000 a year. Five thousand pounds, fifteen billion pounds alone was left on the table last year because people just thought I'm not going to be eligible for this. Um, I can't claim these benefits because I earn too much. That isn't the case. You don't know what you don't know till you know you don't know it. So at least go and check out their website. It's turntous.org. Uh, uk. That's the first port of call. They'll be able to help you access any help that you might be eligible for, including things like household support funds uh, that will be given to you at a grant level from your local council. There are criteria for all of this, but they can guide you. So that will be the first thing that I would say that you need to do, really.
to in the interest of economic stability. And what is important is we work together, including with the SNP, to get through this winter and grow the economy. Yeah. David Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister is to be commended for securing the passage of you're the welcome, Northern Ireland welcome. Protocol Bill through this House without amendment before the summer recess. Can she confirm that it's the government's intention that the bill should remain unamended, and in particular? that the European Court of Justice should have no jurisdiction in any part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Prime Minister. I am completely committed to the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. It deals with the very specific issues we face in Northern Ireland, the free flow of trade, and also making sure that the people of Northern Ireland are able to benefit from being part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. And I can tell my honourable friend that any negotiations will reflect the same position that it is in the Protocol Bill. Yeah. Dave yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, we understand that this afternoon's vote on fracking is deemed a confidence vote in the Prime Minister. Can she give us any reason why her own backbenchers or anyone in this country can have confidence in her after her policies have caused chaos in the markets and wrecked the economy. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr Speaker, we do face very difficult economic times. I have been honest about the mistakes I have made, but what I don't apologise for... I don't know about you, but I, I think she's doing better than maybe people had thought she would. I didn't think that she would be doing this well. I thought that they were going to tear her a new one and, and be relentless. It feels like she's been let off the hook a little bit here. It will be interesting to see what the um, political um, roundup of this will be in terms of if they score this, what's her score? I think she's doing okay, and I don't, I don't necessarily like her and what she's basically done. But looking at it from, I guess, the way she's answered some of the, the way she's been combative and stood her ground, she's been pretty impressive, to be honest. She hasn't cowed away and been a bit shy and kind of, you know timid she hasn't gone into her shell she's come out fighting she's come out swinging um to her credit for is the fact that we have helped households through this winter through the energy price guarantee the fact that we've reversed the national insurance rise and the fact we are taking action to get our railways running rather than being disrupted by the militant trade unions she supports Job Baron. Mr. Speaker, there's been a number of low points. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate recently, it, mate. Thank you. Including the Republic of Ireland's football team singing pro IRA songs in the changing room. We should never forget the sacrifice of those who paid the price to maintain the peace during the Troubles. Closer to home, recent events meant that spending is going to be more constrained than originally thought. May I encourage the Prime Minister? to ensure that we retain compassion in politics in these decisions, including maintaining the link between benefits and inflation. Will she do that? Here come the platitudes. Just watch. Just watch. I mean, the, I think the question is a little too fluffy, a little bit too loose. He's tried to get some substance in there around benefits linking to inflation, but there is no way she's going to commit to that. There is no way. And so she's going to lead with platitudes. She's going to lead with things that she thinks people are going to be able to align with. And she'll. Uh, what, it'll be interesting to hear the wording that she uses. Will she use the same wording that Jeremy Hunt used over the weekend in all of his communication so far? Let's listen. Minister. We are, we are compassionate Conservatives. We will always... to protect the most vulnerable and that is what we did with the energy price guarantee we are going to make sure the most vulnerable are protected into year two and i'm sure the chancellor has heard my honorable friends representations on the contents of the medium-term fiscal plan Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. thank you mr speaker mr speaker like the public at large i've supported the government in terms of the act so it did not so she didn't actually say yes we will she basically said listen we care about people, platitude, because you've got to actually show that you actually do for that to be true. And I think many people will argue that their track record doesn't necessarily prove that they do. So that's a platitude right there. And she just regurgitated some of the stuff and saying, look, 
we're going to look through it in the plan. The chances already use words like we will make sure that we're keeping at the forefront of our mind those who need it the most, the most vulnerable in society. She's just echoing what Jeremy Hunt has said over the over the past weekend. Um, I mean, look, what they're basically saying here, because this is, a, this is just a comment, what, they're, what the guy was asking was, if you're in benefits, right? So if you're on benefits, and I don't know what benefits is right now, probably what, 100 and something, 150 pounds a week or something like that. What he's basically asked is, if the price of things is going up by 10%, will they link that benefit payment so that at least people, the amount that people are getting in benefits keeps up with inflation, the cost of things around them? That was the question. She didn't really answer it directly. She goes, oh, you know, we're looking at a plan at the moment and uh, we're going to keep the most vulnerable in mind. That's essentially what she said. She's not given a firm commitment in any way, shape or form. It's it's classic. Pol it's, it's a classic political answer. But then again, she can't say anything different because if she commits to it and she can't, I guess, deliver it, she's going to get crucified. So. In her mind, playing devil advocate, it's it's a it's a it's a lose lose situation. You're damned if you say it. You're damned if you don't. If you do and you can't deliver it, people are going to come after you. And she said a lot already that she hasn't been able to deliver or has delivered and had to U-turn on. So she's on tender hooks right now, being very 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 I guess uh, conservative, excuse the pun, around what she's saying and what she's putting out there. The actions that has taken to support Ukraine, not least because of, of what's at stake there. But right now, in order to maintain that support, as the public deals with rising prices, inflation, mortgage costs and much else, Ukraine fatigue is a real and present danger. And I'm afraid to say to the Prime Minister, she is now an active driver against that public support that has so unified many of us. That has so unified that has so unified many of us to do what needs to be done. So in a time where... Get to the question, come on, mate. In a time where, in a time where resolve and support of Ukraine needs to be steeled, will she make sure that she commits from the dispatch box that the economic and military and political support won't be another casualty under this Prime Minister? <laughs> It was one of my first acts in office to make sure the military support we give to Ukraine is equal to the military support we gave this year. We must make sure Ukraine win. They can win, they will win, and they must win. So let's just talk about this for a second, because this is a huge point of contention, right? There were arguments from people saying, look, we need the money at home, so why are we sending all of this money over to Ukraine? I think what we're doing is we're sending equipment of that value to Ukraine, not necessarily money. But I think there might be an element of cash money being transferred in in this aid, right? But it is a it is a legitimate question for many people saying, look, should we continue to support Ukraine if we have need for more resources here at home? I think there's a in my head, there's a budget for the military, which is basically being used up. If Jeremy Hunt is going to be looking at efficiencies, cuts, and militaries on the table, then we may see that in the future, Ukraine doesn't get as much aid as it has done from us. But then we start getting into other conversation around, you know, what is this all about, right? If we look at energy prices, which has been the main proponent of inflation for us here in the UK, part of it has been because, well, we've had boycotts on Russia for most of this year, and Russia is one of the largest oil and gas producers in the world. And so we are essentially cutting off one of the largest suppliers of gas and energy in the world. And that is affecting our domestic supplies. Now, we won't get in as much from Russia, but it has had an impact. So many people will argue that you should stop supporting Ukraine because, well, hopefully we'll be able to go back to Russia and maybe cheapen our energy bills because Russia might just say, oh, don't worry about it, guys, all those sanctions and all those weaponry that you sent over to Ukraine, it's fine, we'll just turn on the taps and, you know, give you cheap energy. That's very, very unlikely to happen, in my opinion. I could be wrong. But that question that he's asked right there is because I'm sure he's got people in his, um, in his, um, consi I can't ever say this word, consistent, right, that are asking him this question. And it is a question that needs to be debated, arguably, because, you know, we are a country, it's, it's a democracy at the end of the day. But 
is it the right thing to do? Should we continue? Should we not? I think they've got to make the call in in, in Parliament. My my thoughts are that you have to be really, really careful and you just can't stop the support because that might embolden Russia to say, actually, you know what, we'll we'll do what we want to do. I mean, there's so much stuff going on at the moment that I think support is actually needed for Ukraine. And I personally don't have an issue with it, but I can understand why people will. I actually have to end this stream in about four minutes. Let's see what else she says here, because I've got to jump on a train to London. Um, Mr Speaker, I would like to thank the Prime Minister for sticking by her words and giving communities in Fylde the final say on fracking. But as always, the devil is in the detail. Can the Prime Minister assure me that local consent will be measured independently and transparently, and under no circumstances will fracking companies be directly engaged in assessing local consent? And if people in Fylde say no, that that view and that decision will be respected and acted upon by this government. Yeah, yeah. Well, I very strongly agree with my honourable friend. I know this is something he cares deeply about. I can ensure him that we will consult on the robust system of local consent, give clear advice on seismic limits and safety before any fracking takes place. And the consultation... All right, fracking is a really big conversation as well. And I think that is one where there is a direct opposite opinion in Labour and Conservative. And, you know, they're talking about fracking purely because of the energy pressures that we're under at this point in time. Um, look, I I need to jump on a train. <laughs> I've got a taxi coming up in five minutes because I've got to jump in a train. I'm going to London for two days. I've got meetings tomorrow. I'm speaking at an event on Thursday in London. Um, it's called the uh, Peak Performance Events. It's in central London. It's going to be amazing. There's going to be about maybe 150, 200 people there. We're going to be talking about finances, investment, all that kind of stuff. If you are in London, would love to see you there. If you literally just type in um, Peak Performance Events on Instagram or on Google, you should be able to get a ticket. I would love to see you there if you do watch the channel. But um, this was very much an impromptu one because I thought this might be interesting. Like I said, I've had a ton of feedback saying that you guys have found this really entertaining and actually really cool and to be honest whilst this this is politics and this is not a channel for politics and god knows i've been i've been slated um for covering this kind of stuff in the future i think in the, in the past sorry i think it's important to cover politics when it intersects with money investing and all the things that we do talk about here on the channel and in this case it does I've actually quite enjoyed it, to be honest. It's given me a different kind of content to create for the channel. Um, and as long as you guys are enjoying it, I will indeed continue to do so myself. So um, it's entertaining, right? Um, we should have maybe parties where we watch PMQs or news coming out of Parliament. We can all have some popcorn and a beer and just uh, laugh at the politicians and we can break down some of the policies and maybe what it means uh, to the markets and personal finance. But thank you, every single one of you. I know that there are about 62 of you on here at the minute. We've got the likes at 23. If you could get that up to 40, that would be amazing. It just means that other people who might find this video useful will get to see it because YouTube will be like, oh, people actually inter interacted with this video and they'll try and push it to other people. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if there's any news, maybe tomorrow, Thursday, I will uh, do another live. I'm back here in the house on Friday. So I will definitely speak to you guys on Friday, maybe give an update on uh, on the news and what's going on. But I appreciate you. My taxi is outside. 